Asher will be uh, Le'ilay Nishmata. Thank mm -hmm. you. So uh, today we're departing a little bit from our format. Uh, normally we try to cover the uh, half Torah and connect it to the Parsha. Uh, today, in light of the upcoming uh, Chag that I'm sure everybody is aware of, uh, the holiday called Pesach, so I want to talk in a more general way about the holiday of Pesach. And we know that uh, there are many, many mitzvahs that Pesach has, the mitzvah of eating matzah and maror and rabbinic commandments like the four cups of wine and reclining. Uh, but we know that the centerpiece of the Seder is, of course, the Haggadah. And the Haggadah is the text through which we fulfill a biblical commandment that is called Sipur Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim, that the Torah requires that once a year we narrate the story of God taking us out of Egypt. And this is derived from the verse, you shall tell your child on the day of the Exodus, and Chazal Habedrasha, that that really means the night before, the starting of the day. Because of all that God has done for me, that is why I'm telling this story. And hence, the book of the story is called Haggadah, because it is a fulfillment of the mitzvah Vihi Gadata In other words, the title is exactly mirroring, mirroring the source of the mitzvah itself. And even though, if you read Vihi Gadata Levincha, you might assume that maybe there is only such a mitzvah if I have a child to whom I am recounting. Again, the oral law has various drushos and various ribuyim, various uh, terms of inclusion to teach me that even if a person is by themselves, even if a person is all by themselves, as I know that some people who celebrate a second Seder in Israel will indeed be making a second Seder by themselves, but even the first Seder, uh, one is Mechuyav. In fact, in the Hasidic books, they give a little bit of a twist. If you're all by yourself, you have to speak to the inner child within you. So it actually is a Hasidic thought that a person needs to be perpetually young in their curiosity, in their desire to discover, in their enthusiasm. So if you don't have a physical flesh and blood, a child at your Pesach table, you speak to the child within you. The Navi Hoshea says, Ki nar Yisrael hu v'yehoveyu, quoting the Almighty, because the Jewish people are, is, are perpetually young, therefore I love them. Right, that idea of perpetual youth in a positive in a positive way. Of course, this calls to mind uh, George Bernard Shaw's uh, famous, famous aphorism. It is such a pity that youth is wasted on the young. They don't know how to use it. <laughs> right? When you get a little older, you really appreciate uh, what youth is able to, to accomplish uh, in, so many, in so many ways. So that's the mitzvah of Haggadah. So I want to make a bit of a curmudgeonly uh, little comment about the, the Haggadah. And that is, much of the first part of the Haggadah, which people are most interested in because you're most awake, and the commentaries even tend to be more, such as the Four Sons and all of that, is not really a fulfillment of the narrative. That is really an introductory section of the Haggadah that is explaining that the mitzvah should be geared towards the different personalities of each of your children, and there's a lot of things about how do we know the timing, meaning how do we know when you do the mitzvah, etc. That is not the actual fulfillment of the mitzvah. That is an introductory chapter to describing the mitzvah that we're about to fulfill. So the actual mitzvah gets fulfilled with the part of the Haggadah that many people tune out for, or actually consider relatively boring, but that is the guts of the Haggadah, and that is four verses in Deuteronomy four verses in the book of Devarim that a person recites when they bring the first fruits, and it is a mini encapsulation of the Exodus in four verses. We went down to Mitzrayim, verse one, essentially. We were enslaved, verse two. We prayed and cried out to God, verse three. God took us out, verse four. That's it. Each verse literally says that. And what the Haggadah then does is, it takes fragments of each of those verses and it elucidates them by citing other verses in the, primarily in the book of Shmos. Right, so really, I hope you have Haggadah with the proper typeface and the proper uh, font, that you have four verses, big verses, 
and each verse is then subdivided with what we call drushos. So, in reality, one might uh, say that this is a funny way to say that, that to recount the story of the Exodus. Since the story of the Exodus is in the book of Exodus, the book of Shmos, why do I use the four verses of Bikurim, which I then elucidate by reference to Psukim in Shemos? I ought to go and just read the Psukim in Shemos. Read the whole story. So just Bikitzer, just al derech pshat, just in terms of simple pshat, I want to give you four reasons why Chazal chose the four verses of Bikurim as the structure for the story of the Exodus. Reason number one is brevity. If you have to go back and read the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim from the book of Exodus, you will have to read 12 chapters mm. of the Chumash. Uh, now, Magid is long enough as it is anyway, especially if you're supposed to eat the Afikomen before midnight. So consequently, Chazal picked what is called Derech Kitzara. Now again, many people will say, I can't believe it. Are you telling me the Haggadah is Derech Kitzara? The answer is it is, because the narrative in Exodus is a much, much longer narrative, which a lot more detail. So reason number one is Derech Kitzara. Reason number two is the methodology of Gezeira Shava. Gezeira Shava is Chazal would compare two different areas of Halacha, based on a common word between them. And that is, the mitzvah of Sipri Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is introduced by the term vihigadata levincha. And when a person brings the first fruits and he declares this mini history in gratitude to the Almighty, it says, higadati hayom l'ashem elokecha. I am declaring today to Hashem. So through the Gezei Rashava, Hagada, Hagada, Higadati, and Vihigadata, Chazal saw that Bikurim was the appropriate text for the Haggadah. Reason number three is the essence of the recitation when a person brings the first fruits is one of gratitude to the Almighty for the kindnesses that he has given us. Now, consequently, Chazal understood that the narrative of the Exodus is exactly the same theme gratitude to Hashem for geula, for freedom, for opportunity to be able to serve him. And consequently, they saw the mitzvah of Bikurim as the appropriate paradigm for the way we fulfill the mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Reason number four is maybe the most interesting reason of all. One of the points that has been observed over and over and over again is the virtual, it's not 100%, it's, but it's 99.9%, .9 absence of Moshe Rabbeinu's name in the Haggadah. You wouldn't even know that Moshe Rabbeinu existed, that there was such a person. We make reference to the staff, but we don't say the staff of Moshe, and even the reference to the staff, Moshe is not mentioned. Now, Moshe is mentioned exactly once in the Haggadah, and if you want to keep your kids up, if you have younger children, you might want to say anyone that you know, gets it will get an extra prize besides the Apikomen prize. <coughs> and that is, when he discusses the famous passage, uh, how many plagues were in Egypt and how many plagues were on the Red Sea. And there's a certain correlation because the plagues in Egypt are called the finger of God and the plagues on the Red Sea are called the hand of God. So consequently, whatever was in Mitzrayim was five times more in the Red Sea. So one opinion says 10 in Mitzrayim, 50 in the Red Sea. The other says every Makkah in Mitzrayim had four components, so 40 in Mitzrayim, 200 on the Red Sea, and Rabbi Akiva says every plague in Egypt had uh, five components, so that's 50 in Mitzrayim and 250 in the Red Sea. Now again, I've never seen a list. I have seen a list of trying to enumerate the 50 plagues in the Red Sea. I never saw anything going with the 200 and the 250, but whatever that means, in the middle of that discussion, when he tries to show that the Makot are called the finger of Hashem, Etzba Elohim, and the Red Sea is the Yad of Hashem, it quotes the verse, Vayar Yisrael es hayad hagdola, they saw the great hand, Asher Asa Hashem b'Mitzrayim, that God did uh, in Egypt, Vayiru ha'am es Hashem, and they revered God, Vyaminu b'Hashem, they believed in God, Uva Moshe Avdo, bingo, that is the only reference of Moshe Rabbeinu in the entire Haggadah. And the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu is de-emphasized so much 
is because there was always this issue that Moshe Rabbeinu did so many miracles, he was so great, he was so above a typical human being, beyond what we could even comprehend, that there was always a risk that the Torah was cognizant of, that Moshe might be deified or seen to be a godlike figure. Uh, in fact, the Drush Saran says, that is why Moshe had to be a stutterer, so people would be aware of his human imperfections. That is why lo yada ish et kavurato, nobody knows where Moshe Rabbeinu is buried, so that shouldn't become a shrine or a place of, of, of idolatry. <coughs> and consequently, this Pesach Seder, which is the celebration of God redeeming us from Egypt, we want to de-emphasize the human actor. Now, think about it this way. If you were to use Sefer Shemos as your text of the Haggadah, you couldn't escape Moshe Rabbeinu. He is mentioned in every single verse. So Chazal were looking, desperately looking, for a portion in the Torah that describes the Exodus without making any mention of Moshe Rabbeinu. That's not easy to find. It happens to be in these four verses of Bikurim, it does not mention Moshe Rabbeinu's name. So that's a fourth reason to kind of continue the idea of the de-emphasis of Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, there's a nice drash when the Haggadah emphasizes that it was God that killed the firstborn of Egypt and no angel. So it says three statements. Ani, I, velo malach, and not an angel. Then it says again, Ani, it was I, velo saraf. Saraf is also a burning angel. And then it says, Ani, it was I, Velo Hashaliach, and not the emissary. Now Hashaliach is a little bit of an unusual form. Normally with Ani Velo Shaliach, what's Hashaliach? So in the Hasidic Shesvarim, they say in nice Russia that if you take the first letter of those three words, Malach, Ani, and not a Malach, Mem, Ani Velo Saraf, which is the letter Shin, Ani Velo Hashaliach, it spells out Moshe, mm -hmm. that Hashem is saying, yeah, Moshe did a lot for me. Moshe was a faithful emissary, but he was not the one that took you out. It was God Almighty that took you out. So it's interesting, I, that, you know, as I say, a lot of people tune out for this portion of the Haggadah simply because I would suggest even because structurally they don't understand what's going on. But essentially the structure is fairly simple. We are taking four verses from the mitzvah of reading the Bikurim, and then we are simply subdividing phrases within those verses and elucidating them by bringing in further detail primarily from the book of Shemot. And this is actually standard medrash. And in fact, this portion of the Haggadah is lifted verbatim, essentially, from the Mechilta, from the medrash halacha and Shemot. It's simply in the Mechilta itself, and the Mesadre, the Haggadah, simply, simply put it in. But okay. Now, this mitzvah, as I said, is called the mitzvah of Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim. But in addition to the annual mitzvah of Sipor, there is a daily mitzvah to remember the Exodus. And this is a mitzvah in the Torah as well. And when we say remember, zechira, that doesn't just mean in your mind, but zechira requires verbalization. And they are derived from two different verses. Uh, the verse of Sipor is v'higadata lavincha b'yomahu leimor, you should tell your son uh, on that day, and that's only on that day, the Leil Pesach. But the mitzvah of Zechira is another verse. Laman Tiskor, you shall remember, Yom Tzeischa, measure the day that you uh, were taken out of Egypt, Kol Yemei Chayecha, all the days of your life. And the, this, these, this mitzvah is given a different name. The mitzvah of Leil Pesach is Sipor, the mitzvah of Kol Hashana is Zechira. Now, how do we fulfill the mitzvah of Zechira, Kol Yemot Hashana? Well, you can fulfill it any way you want, but the way that is standard is that in the third paragraph of Shema, which is the Parsha of the Tzitzis, there is a verse that says, Ani Hashem Elokeichem, I am the Lord your God, Asher Hotzei Siyatchem Me'eretz Mitzrayim, 
who took you out of Egypt, Lios Lachem Lelokim, to be for you a God. And if you have an art scroll sitter or the like, there's actually a little note in the sitter that says, one should have intention when reciting this verse to fulfill the positive commandment in the Torah to remember the exodus of Egypt. Now, here is a simple question I'm going to uh, share with you. And again, I'm not sure if I'm fully going to answer it, but it's something to think about structurally. And that is the following. There is a machlokas in the Mishnah and Masachis Brachos. If the mitzvah of remembering the Exodus is only in the daytime, because that's when we left, or is it even at night? It's certainly in the daytime, but is it even at night? If you remember, the Haggadah itself quotes Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. Amar Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. Harei ani keven shivim shana. Behold, I am like a person that is 70 years old. If you remember the famous story, and the story is not that relevant to our topic, but the story was that uh, Rabbi Gamliel was the head of the Sanhedrin, and he was deposed in a palace revolt, so to speak, because he mistreated Rabbi Yoshua, and uh, they were not sure who they should uh, appoint in his place. They thought to appoint Rabbi Yoshua would rub salt in Rabbi Gamliel's wounds, so they settled on a compromise candidate, you might call him a dark horse, and that was the uh, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, who was very learned, very righteous, he was wealthy, so he could deal politically with the Roman powers. He was uh, related to Ezra, so he had yichus and sechut avot. But Chaval, he was only 18 years old, quite amazing, 18 years old. And uh, there was a fear that people would not respect him. So miraculously it is recorded that his beard turned white overnight. Mm -hmm. And that is the meaning of the statement, behold, I am like a person 70 years old. Uh, my wife suggests a more rational interpretation. Uh, she says that perhaps his beard turned prematurely white from the responsibility that he had. That could scare a person. And she reminds me that uh, all of our friends who didn't go into the rabbinate still have uh, dark, uh, dark beards. So maybe there's something to that uh, interpretation. Uh, as well, the Arizal offers a Kabbalistic interpretation. This is, this is an amazing interpretation. He says that Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah was a reincarnation, a Gilgal, of the prophet Shmuel. Shmuel died tragically young at the age of 52. So when Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah was born, he was given a soul that has already spent 52 years on earth. So when he was 18 years old, his soul had 70 years of earthly existence. Thus he could say, behold, I am like a man of 70 years old. Question? Yeah, yeah. We understand from this verse that there's some special mystical significance to the uh, number 70. And why shouldn't he have said, behold, I'm like a man of 75 or 65? Yeah, well, um, I, I don't know. You know, that's a, that's a good question. It seems that 70 is identified in the Torah itself as the old age that you honor, honor the elderly and the like. So, so 70 is given that, uh, that, 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 that uh, zman. And they say, batakum, badarta pene zaken. The zaken is 70. 70 is zikna. And it may be connected. It may be connected to comparing decades of life to the days of creation in which uh, when you enter, uh, when you've completed seven uh, decades, you've completed the cycle of life in its completion and everything else is new, new life after that. I know some people have a minute, uh, yeah, it's brought down even, that when they're 83 years old, they have a new bar mitzvah because mm -hmm. they consider themselves born at 70 and they continue a new life. Every uh, year after that is a new gift of life that Hashem has, has given. But putting aside the reference, I'm holding them 70, what is that going to say? And I was not aware, or I, I, I was not, I did not merit to know that you have to mention the Exodus at night until Ben Zoma proffered an interpretation that since it says you must remember the Exodus all the days of, of, of your life, if it would have said the days, that would have meant the days, all the days, 
includes the night. Now, here is the question. That Mishnah is not talking about the annual mitzvah of Sipor. The annual mitzvah of Sipor, there is no dispute. Not only do you do it at night, you only do it at night. That debate is about the daily mitzvah of Zechira, in which some rabbis say only in the day and not at night. And Ben Zoma says in the day and also at night. So a very simple question, what is the relevance of Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah's discussion to anything we're doing Pesach night? That discussion is about the whole year. It has nothing to do with Pesach night. You see, if, if you wouldn't have this background, you might make the mistake, well, I need to establish there's a mitzvah at night because that allows me to proceed with the Seder. But that's erroneous. There is no debate about Leil Seder. Leil Seder corresponds to the eating of the Korban Pesach, which is certainly at night. So a very, very simple question is, the whole discussion of Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria and ben Zoma and the fact that all the, the days of your life mean the days and all the days of your life mean the night, that has no shaykhus, that has no relevance to Leil Seder. So to, to answer this question, let's go back in a more general uh, point, and that is, Rav Chaim Salavechik, the great Rav Chaim of Brisk, at the beginning of every Seder, he would always introduce the Seder with the following question. The Torah commands us that on the night of the Exodus, we must tell a story. But the Torah does not command us to use the Haggadah. The Haggadah is a rabbinic text. Do Raisa, you could tell the story in your own words. Now, Rav Chaim asked the Kasha, since every single night anyway, there's a mitzvah of Zechira, so even if the Torah wouldn't have given me the special mitzvah of Sipor, I would have to mention the Exodus. What is the Torah telling me to do on this night that I wouldn't already have to do because of the norm, the general mitzvah of Zechira? So and you, you can't... Say again? You got to tell what, in other words, to have another person to tell it to? Yes. Okay, if there is another person. Okay, that, that's true. In fact, that, that might be an answer in, the, in, in that uh, the special chiddish of Leo Pesach is the obligation to interact with another. Yes, if you have no that. other obligation like that for the rest of the year. That's, that's true. On the other hand, let me point out that even if you are by yourself and you're not interacting, you still have a mitzvah. And then the question is, what is it adding? So Rav Chaim said, Behechrech, Sipor is telling you to do more than Zechira. One aspect might be the interaction, but he also identified four structural elements that Sipor has that Zechira does not have. And the Haggadah incorporates, the structure of the Haggadah is based on, it is a, a textual incorporation of these four elements. Element number one, is called She'ila Utshuva, that the Exodus story must be recounted through a question and answer process. It is not enough to just say, God took me out of Egypt. There must be questions and answers. Now, of course, the Manishtana is the explicit question, but really all questions are good. And even if you're by yourself, you have to ask questions. In fact, I remember even years ago, I was a little, little child, but it struck me even then as, as funny. Uh, we were invited to uh, Seder at somebody's house, and uh, the Balabayas uh, was anxious to get going. It was late. And uh, his kids kept on, kept on asking him questions about the Seder. And they were good questions. Uh, so the father finally got so annoyed, he said, stop asking questions, we have to go run the Seder. <laughs> Which is kind of, you know, a little bit the opposite, opposite of the point. In fact, Chazal even enacted doing certain rituals only so the kid will ask the questions. For example, at the beginning of the Magid, the matzah is moved to the end of the table. So the child will ask, why did you move the matzah? And then you're in a, you really have a quandary because the answer is, oh, I moved the matzah so you would ask me why I moved the matzah. <laughs> so why did you move the matzah? So you'd ask. Okay, you got it. 
figure out how to avoid the infinite loop in those types of, uh, in those types of answers. But be it as it may, and I'll, I'll come to why this is important. I, wa I want to enumerate them first, then I'll go back and show why they're important. So element number one that is unique to Sipor that does not apply to Zechira is question and answer. Element number two is what the Mishnah calls Maschil Bignus Umesayem Bishvach. The whole year, I just have to talk about God took me out of Egypt, or took us out of, out of Egypt. Leil Pesach, I gotta begin with the negative. I can't just talk about the redemption. I, got, I gotta talk about the denigration, the degradation, the suffering, the slavery. Now, there is a machlokas in the Gemara, actually. What is the negative that you emphasize? According to one opinion, it is the slavery and the servitude. According to the other opinion, it was the paganism and the idolatry. And that is why the Haggadah incorporates two different stories that have been melded together. There is the story of the journey from slavery to freedom, and there is the story of the journey from paganism to monotheism. And both of those stories are combined together. But you've got to start with the so-called bad. You can't just go to the good. Again, I'll come back to this too. Element three that differentiates Sipor from Zechira, and that is Rabban Gamliel's statement that unless you explain the significance of the Korban Pesach, the Matzah, and the Maror, not just eat them, explain them, you have not fulfilled your mitzvah. What mitzvah haven't you fulfilled? You have not fulfilled the mitzvah of Haggadah. Haggadah requires that you explain the significance of Pesach Matzah Maror, which of course is not true for Zechira but the, rest of, the rest of the year. By the way, this is an important thing uh, for people to be aware of because the Rabbi Gamliel paragraphs are towards the end of the Magid, shortly before the second cup. So whoever is handling the food, usually it's the woman of the house, but it, you know, it could be the men as well, they go into the kitchen and they may start uh, setting up. Now, if you're going to skip something in the Haggadah, the Rabbi Gamliel paragraphs are specifically the ones you better not skip. Uh, because if those paragraphs are not said in Hebrew or English, English is perfectly fine, uh, you are literally not Yotzei the Mitzvah. So whoever is getting up to go into the kitchen needs to either go ahead and say those paragraphs before they get up, or uh, come back and say them before they drink the second cup, so that by the time they drink the second cup, they've done it. There are portions of that gutter that can be skipped. In other words, if you walked out for the four sons, but nobody likes that because that's so like fun, the fun part of the gutter, or uh, if you fell asleep for Chad Gadja, or the like, you know, you're, you are okay. Arami uh, Obeid uh, Avi. There too, you need, you need to be awake. You need to, yeah, Arami Obeid Avi and Rabban Gamliel are, are essential parts of Avi. So Avi's number four, Avi. number two is that number four is Arami Obeid Avi? No, because I included that because in the, in the Maschil Bignus, the Messiah Mishvach, we talk about Arami, that we were with Laban, et cetera, that's part so of that's it. that's included. That's included in Maschil Bignus, yeah. That's good. So we do Paskin, uh, just like by Kiddush and by other things, Shomeya Kaona, that if I listen to a recitation, I get the uh, credit for saying it. So that applies to the Haggadah itself as a general rule. Uh, many people have a minute, they say the Haggadah along with the person conducting the Seder, but, but if you are listening, even if you don't verbalize, uh, you are going to be Yotze under the principle of Shomeya Kaona. So that's going to be okay. But you do have to either hear it or say it and the like. Right, now again, I'll come back to it. Now the fourth element is really the most difficult. And that is, this is the passage in the Haggadah that says, Chayav Adam Liros Es Atzmo Ki'ilu Hu Yotza Mimitzrayim. Each person must regard themselves as if they personally were liberated from you. <coughs> and this is a fundamental difference in orientation between Sipor Leil Pesach and Zechira the whole year. 
Zechira the whole year is simply remembering what God did for our forefathers. Leil Pesach, we are mechuyev to experience as if we were literally there. The Briskarov used to say, Rav Chaim's son used to say, that this was the hardest mitzvah of all of Pesach because we weren't there. How do I experience being there? Again, I will go back and explain these things now, but I just wanted to bring out the point that Rav Chaim says, uh, teaches us that there are four distinctions between Sipur and Zechira, and the Haggadah is predicated on these four distinctions. Sheila Utshuva, questions and answers. Matchil Bignut, beginning with the negative, which is either slavery or paganism. Number three, explaining Pesach, Matzah, Moror. Number four, is personally experiencing liberation. And I think I would add yours as a fifth, the idea that when, you, when it is possible to interact and share the story with your children, you are obligated to do so, which is not true for the, the rest of the year. The rest of the year, Zechira is what I do myself. I don't have to interact or communicate. So now, let's put this in a broader framework. And let's start with the fourth element, which is really the most important here, and that is, each person must regard themselves as if they themselves were liberated from Mitzrayim. Question is, what does that mean? I was not in Mitzrayim, I certainly was not a slave in Mitzrayim. What does it mean I must regard myself as if I was liber liberated? Now, the first point is, don't confuse this with a somewhat similar idea that's expressed at the beginning of the Seder, in which if God would not have taken us out of Egypt, we, our children, our children's children would still be enslaved in one way or the other. That's simply saying, I'm grateful for God liberating my ancestors, because had he not liberated my ancestors, I might be suffering in one way or the other. But that's not the same thing as saying God liberated me. Later, the Haggad is making a more, much more radical claim. I myself experienced, or must feel that I experienced Yitzhiat Mitzrayim. So let me give you two explanations. Explanation number one is the Rambam, and I think we, we talked about this a few weeks ago, in fact, in the beginning of Sefer Shmos. The Rambam says it is the creative use of imagination to feel the emotional intensity of an experience, which means it's frankly make-believe, but it's make-believe for a good purpose. I wasn't a slave, but in order for me to appreciate what the Almighty did for Am Yisrael, I have to imagine myself as a slave. Meaning to say, I gotta, you know, if you're familiar with method acting, Lee Strasberg, Marlon Brando, all of that, I have to put myself in the moment. What was it like to be tortured, to be beaten, to be humiliated? to carry loads that were beyond my strength, not to have adequate food and shelter. And you imagine yourself, you use the power of imagination to put yourself in that moment. Yeah. So, Lee Strasberg yeah. <laughs> taught us that in order to feel it, you have to draw on past experience. Yeah. So if you're acting anguish at a, uh, at a parent, you have to feel the experience that you went through. Yes. What you're suggesting is not that. You're suggesting is something that comes out of nowhere. Well, and that's very, very, yeah. that's much harder. Yeah, it might be harder, yeah. The but the truth of the matter is, let me, let me point out, let me point out that through most of Jewish history, I think you could apply the Strasbourg model almost exactly because Jewish people generally lived in persecuting <laughs> environments and the like, and there, there, were, there were aspects of slavery, enslavement, persecution, suffering, and discrimination that Jews would be able to connect. Good, but now yeah. in the 21st century... It'll be harder, granted, granted, it'll be harder, I it'll be harder. it's impossible. Well, I don't know if it's impossible, but, but nevertheless, the Rambam suggests the use of imagination to relive, not to relive, but to experience something you never experienced, and that is the notion of slavery. So according to the Rambam, and again, I, I, we can call it make-believe. Again, I don't mean that negatively or pejoratively, but basically, in order to feel gratitude to the Almighty, you have to try to relive it in some way. The second explanation, 
is that that's offered by the Balatanya. And this is a, an explanation that's very, very beautiful and, and very popular in Hasidus and Kabbalah. And that is, the word Mitzrayim has a double meaning. Mitzrayim, of course, means the ancient empire of Egypt. And of course, we do believe that the Egyptian slavery was a historical fact and the Exodus was a historical fact. But Mitzrayim also comes from the word Meitzar, which has limitation, boundary, constriction, blockage. David HaMelech says in Halal, Min HaMeitzar, from the narrow constricting places, I call out to God. Anoni Bamerchav, Hashem, answer me with expansiveness. And based on this, the Balatanya writes, every single person has their own inner Mitzrayim. My Mitzrayim, what blocks me from connecting to Hashem, from becoming the person I, I'm able to become, I should be able to become? A person can have a Mitzrayim of arrogance, gaiva, hubris, anger, lack of self-esteem in which they think they're worthless and ineffectual. Laziness, hedonism, whatever it would be, those are my mitzrayims. Those are blocking me. They're stopping me from moving forward. Now here's what the Balatanya says. You know, we're used to, at least if you're not uh, an Einsteinian physicist, but if you're just a regular person perceiving time, we tend to perceive time generally, the simple a conception of time is a linear progression. There's past, present, future, there's a river of time, it only moves in one direction, can't go backwards, can only go forward, and therefore anything in the past is, can only be commemorated and remembered. It is not relived, per se. And yet, in mystical terms, time is not linear, time is cyclical. And that is, when we say Leo Pesach, Pesach, is Yitziat Mitzrayim, it is not just the same date that is reoccurring. It is the same moment in time that has come back. And in that moment in time, there is a spiritual power. When God liberated the Jewish people on that day, God put a power into the world that enables every person to be liberated from the Mitzrayim that enslaves them. You piggyback, if I could use such a phrase, on Yitziat Mitzrayim to become liberated from your own inner Mitzrayim. And therefore the meaning of the sentence, each person must regard themselves as if they were liberated from Mitzrayim does not mean each person must make believe that they were a slave in Egypt from which they were liberated but each person must identify their Mitzrayim and believe that God has given them the power to be liberated from the Mitzrayim that enslaves them. Is and this a, your oh, no, 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 this is the Balatanya. This is, saying. This is the Balatanya's uh, explanation. I mean, I'm elaborating a little bit, so you, know, you might not see everything that I'm saying, but it's based on the, certainly based on the Balatanya. Now, we know at the same time, this is also a major theme in burning chametz. Chametz is often described as puffed up, arrogant. Burning the chametz is described as destroying the arrogance within me. The Yetzirah is called the leavening agent in the dough. Uh, in fact, you know, I think the largest seder in the world, uh, it probably still is, is in Kathmandu in Nepal. And Chabad, uh, of course, runs a seder for uh, 2,000 or 3,000 people, even a little bigger than uh, Poston's uh, Seder this year, and uh, you, never the, know, you never know. You never know. You never know. Maybe you know. Amir uh, Hashem, especially in Yerushalayim. Certainly, Yerushalayim should have the biggest seder in, in, in the world. Uh, but uh, and of course, most of the people that are there are Israelis. You know, many Israelis after the army service like to tour, and they go up there. And even though most of them are not religious at all, but you know, Pesach seder, they want to be connected to something uh, from home, and they go to the Pesach seder. But because the audience are not, you know, largely orthodox, they do things a little avant-garde. So they actually have a custom on Erev Pesach, in which as they make a big bonfire to burn the bread, every person writes something on a piece of paper 
some negative character trait that they want to destroy and they throw it into the fire that it should be burned away with the chametz. Now, you know, a religious person hears that and says, oh, that's another new age spiritual stuff, you know, what type of thing. But the truth of the matter is, this is very, very close to the actual spirit of what Biur Chametz does represent. Because on one hand, Pesach cleaning, you can't get away with this. There's certainly a lot of hard physical work uh, that you have to do. In fact, you know, perennially, you know, people always put out these guides, you know, Pesach cleaning made easy. You know, they try to do this. And whatever they say, you know, I never get anything out of those guides because they, they start off with one page, oh, Pesach cleaning is easy, and then they just make it as hard as everybody else, you know. <laughs> they never give you some magic bullet because there really is no magic bullet other than the general statement that Pesach cleaning doesn't have to be general spring cleaning. Well, you know, that, that happens to be true. But in terms of chametz, you know, you're kind of stuck. But we have to be aware that in addition to the physical chametz, there is the chametz of the heart. So whether you describe that as chametz or whether, as the Balatanya described it, Mitzrayim, Leo Pesach is that great Yitziat Mitzrayim. Break down the boundaries, the constrictions, the blockages that limit you. They tell a beautiful story about a Hasidic Rebbe who spent many, many hours in searching for chametz with his Talmidim. And they did a really, really good job, and they were pretty happy with themselves. But at the end of the whole ceremony, the Rebbe started crying. The Rebbe said, we got all the chametz in the house. Then he pointed to his chest. What about all the chametz in here? How are we going to search for the chametz in here? So the Talmidim gave him a beautiful answer. Rebbe, the first Mishnah in Psachim says, a place that you don't bring in chametz, you don't have to search. So the Rebbe, your heart is a place that no chametz ever goes in. Well, that's a good answer for the Rebbe, but you know, uh, for, for many of us, you know, maybe we need to do a betikas chametz there as, 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 as well. So this is the inner meaning of each person must regard themselves as if they themselves were taken out of Mitzrayim. Now, based on this idea, it turns out that the Haggadah is really two different stories in one. It is on one level the national story of the Jewish people, how we became a nation, how we were chosen by God, how God liberated us through miracles, and he demonstrated his love and his providence over and over again. And this is the story that a parent lovingly communicates to their children generation to generation. And as you know, even people that are very, very far from traditional Judaism on some level or the other gravitate towards the Seder. So we'll call that the national story, which of course is the main story. But in addition to that national story, the Balatanya is saying, there's also a private idiosyncratic story. And that is, as a person identifies their own Mitzrayims and how the Koach of Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim can liberate me from that which enslaves me in so many ways. So if you understand level, uh, the fourth level Rav Chaim talks about, the personal liberation, I'm explaining Rav Chaim, it's interesting. I'm saying Rav Chaim in light of the Balatanya. We can now look at the other three elements in the same way. Because we can look at the Seder as not only a recounting of the historical exodus, but as a step-by-step -step guide to achieving my own spiritual liberation from that which enslaves me. So let's take the elements one by one. Element number one that differentiates Sipur from Sechira is derech she'ela u'tshuva. You know, if you ever listen to any Dvar Torah, if you've said a Dvar Torah, you know that all kimat, all Dvar Torah begin with questions that have to be answered. In fact, a student in Arsameach asked me once, do you have to begin every Dvar Torah with a question? So I think I said, why not? Again, you know, uh, but there is a good point here because what is a question? A question essentially says I'm reaching out to understand something I don't understand 
meaning a question is a receptivity to grow, a willingness to move to another level. <clears throat> you see, when I don't have questions, I just have answers. I'm not moving anywhere. I'm simply declaring what is within me already. A question is the open desire to continue to go further in life. That is why in Lashon HaKodesh, we call a great scholar of Torah by the appellation Talmid Chacham. Now, Talmid Chacham literally means a student of the wise. So why would you call Rav Aji Yosef, Rav Yashif, you know, I call them, they are great Talmidei Chachamim. They're students? That, that's what you call them? Great students? The answer is yes, because true greatness is a perpetual desire to grow, to continue to learn. You know, they tell an old story, this is actually a true story, that uh, Rabbi Eliezer Silver was one of the great, great rabbis. He was a gadol from Europe who came to the United States in the 1920s and uh, really was one of the Gadole Hador in Cincinnati. But his first position was in New England, and legend has it, I'm not sure if it's 100% true, that he was fired from his first synagogue because they didn't like the fact that he was wasting electricity by learning at night in the show. This is the 1920s. And when he said, but I'm learning Torah, they said, that's even worse. We hired a rabbi who finished his education. <laughs> now, if you didn't finish your education, then you defrauded us, etc. Now, we know how ridiculous that is. So, Shelu Tshuva is the imperative to continue to want to grow, not to simply say, this is what I am. You know, Franz Rosenzweig, who a very, very eminent uh, Jewish uh, German philosopher, uh, gradually became more and more observant uh, as he grew older, he died uh, relatively young because of multiple sclerosis. Uh, but he was asked, you know, some of his Ju Jewish German colleagues who were much more assimilated than him made fun of him. And uh, they actually said, oh, I bet you you're even wearing tefillin, as if that's the biggest insult you could give. And his response was, not yet. And it's been pointed out that not yet is a very different type of response than no. He could have just said no, I'm not. <laughs> not yet says, I'm on a journey, and I don't know where I will be, but I, I want to move, I want to grow. I don't want to close myself off. What I am today does not dictate what I can be tomorrow. What I was yesterday doesn't have to define what I am today. So Shelu Tshuva, as it relates to the spiritual liberation idea, is the willingness to be open and receptive, to go beyond your comfort zone, to expand your horizons. And by the way, this is not only a challenge for a not yet religious person, I mean, this is a challenge for everybody, all of us, all of us, to be able to adopt new ways of looking at things, to adopt a broader consciousness of things, to be willing to explore, to be willing to think, not to simply live on automatic <coughs> pilot. So that's Shelo Tshuva. Now, second level, begin with the negative. Why is it so important to begin with the negative? Why can't I just talk about the good stuff? Why do I have to talk about the bad stuff? So there, again, there are different reasons. One might be I only appreciate the blessings of God when I contemplate uh, what life was like without them. The person appreciates health much more uh, after they were ill or even while they're ill than they may have had when they were not ill. So it might be a before and after type of comparison. But there's actually a much deeper idea. And that is, when we contemplate the Exodus, we are not just grateful for the Exodus, but we recognize that the slavery itself gave us certain characteristics that we otherwise would not have. The Torah says, for example, you shall love the ger, convert, but literally ger means stranger. Love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. This is a fundamental point of Jewish ethics. When you look around, and you see the poor 
the downtrodden, the dispossessed, the so-called insignificant people without power. And you're sitting high and mighty in your land. Don't ignore them. Draw on your collective memory of what it was like to be oppressed, what it was like to suffer, and use the negative dark experiences in your past as a source of vibrant compassion. This is why it is virtually in the spiritual DNA of the Jewish people to have compassion. Sometimes the compassion may be inappropriately expressed, but whether it's the civil rights movement in the United States and South Africa, uh, whether it's the fact that Israel to this very day is a first responder in virtually any catastrophe that occurs throughout the world, even to people who at a, at a moment would be happy to destroy uh, the state of Israel. This is why, rightly or wrongly, because sometimes we have to get our priorities, we open our country to refugees from all sorts of environments. This is why Jews were historically liberal, whether that was a correct political decision or not. This is why so many Jews were communists. You know, if a Jew became a communist, it was not for the same reason as maybe other people. Jews did not become communists for power grabs. Jews became communists out of compassion. They thought, they thought, obviously it was a wrong turn in history, but they thought this was a way of alleviating the misery and sufferings of others. And this is even why, again, a, uh, not a correct response in light of everything else, that Jews gravitate uh, towards our friends in East Jerusalem and the like. Jews feel the pain of others, even when others don't feel either their own pain or the pain of the Jews. And this is a precious gift in many, many ways, the gift of empathy, the gift of compassion. But we acquired it not through the Exodus, we acquired it through the shared experience of slavery and suffering. So the deeper meaning of why we have to emphasize the slavery is not to simply create a before and after context, but to understand that even in the adversity of life, there are hidden blessings. Here, those of you that are familiar with uh, Viktor Frankl's work, Man's Search for Meaning, really makes a very, very magnificent book and overall really a magnificent philosophy. And that is the idea that the human being has very little control over what life puts in our way. Things happen. Sometimes devastating things happen. And why God allows it to happen or does God dictate it to happen, that's the book of Job. And there's so much we don't understand at the end of the day. But Viktor Frankl said the last freedom of man is how they choose to respond to the hand that they're dealt. You can choose to respond with bitterness and anger and hate. And you can choose to respond with resilience and compassion and love. And that is the true measure of a human being. And therefore, the inner meaning of beginning with the bad, culminating in the good, is to recognize the redemptive potential of even the adversities and challenges of life, in which a person, in fact, Rav Nachman of Breslov says, a person cannot always pray that they will not have sorrows. It doesn't always work. But a person could pray to Hashem. Yeah, a person cannot always pray that they will not have sorrows, not have adversity. But a person should pray that they be able to grow from the adversities that they have, that they become transformed. And that is lesson number two. Lesson number one, questions and answers. Open yourself up to move. Number two, understand that every experience in life is a teacher. And sometimes we can grow more from our failings and our failures than our successes. And adversities can enable us to, to discover within us powers and abilities and capacities 
that we never knew existed. Again, uh, Viktor Frankl talks about this. I mean, it's interesting. I quote Viktor. I mean, I cite Viktor Frankl. And again, there's not a single Torah source in his book. I mean, he was a Jew without Jewish education, but as a deeply spiritual, intuitive person, uh, he more or less came up with what Judaism teaches on these very, very topics. So I think it's almost. Uh, He's an honorary safer. He's, he's admitted in the pantheon of Jewish books simply because what he states is so consistent with, uh, with Jewish values. Uh, now, we then come to Rabbi Gamliel. Pesach Matzah That's really three in one, but let me just talk about those three. And that is, let's start with Maror first. Maror is tasting the bitterness of slavery. How does that connect to personal liberation? In order to be liberated from that which enslaves you, you have to be honest enough to yourself to acknowledge there's a slavery. As long as one doesn't even acknowledge it, as long as, long as one lives in a state of denial, as long, until the slave recognizes he's a slave, he can, make, he can make no movement towards being liberated. So Maror says, be honest. Be real, be authentic. If somebody has an anger problem, recognize it. If someone has a relationship problem, recognize it. Take steps to fix it or disengage from it. Don't remain in slavery. Take the next step. That's Maror. So Maror is, well, Maror is to be honest in identifying slavery. You know, take the next step is really matzah. Now, matzah is take action. Because here's the thing, the morale points out, in addition to the idea of matzah being arrogant, it's puffed up, morale makes another point. I'm sorry, chametz, chametz, chametz. Morale makes another point in chametz and matzah, and that is chametz represents inertia and stagnation. Why is that so? Because if water hits flour, you don't need to do anything to make it chametz. You don't have to add yeast. You don't have to add leavening. Halakhically, it will become chametz automatically if the water is, remains on the flour <coughs> for 18 minutes or so. So chametz is what occurs with inertia. Matzah requires the affirmative action of baking. So the relationship of moror and matzah is the following. Moror is the honesty to recognize my inner slavery. But matzah is the courage to take action to deal with it. You know, there are people who may go to psycho Freudian psychoanalysis or whatever, neo-psychoanalysis, and they may, be, they may be in analysis for many, many years, decades, decades. And they know every problem, every trauma that they have going back to birth and pre-birth -pre trauma and a pregnancy trauma and preconception trauma, <laughs> such a thing, going all the way back. Right? But the question then becomes, what do you do about it? You know, a person who become wedded to their problems and never want to change it. It happens. A person becomes connected. You know, I know that in the abuse, this is a very sensitive topic, and I, I, maybe I don't, I don't want to hurt any feelings because whenever this is brought up, it, it's always a very, very sensitive point. But you know, there are many, many victims in society. There are victims of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. They're dying out, but Baruch Hashem, we still have some with us. There are victims of sexual abuse, victims of emotional abuse, victims of physical abuse. Victims, victims of terrorism. But a person's goal in life is not to be a victim. A person's goal in life has to be to be a survivor. To take all of that pain, but go beyond it, to rebuild, to recreate. Look at how so many survivors of the Holocaust who lost so much in the most brutal conditions that one could possibly imagine. Hearts that were so broken. Bodies and souls that were so shattered came and created families, built businesses, built the state of Israel, more, more or less as well. 
And they're no longer victims. They're people that survive and transcend victimization. And therefore, maror is the honesty to understand my slavery. Don't deny it. Matzah is do something about it constructively. Move forward. Don't be a victim or don't define yourself by victimhood. But take it and move it in a constructive way. Now, the last thing is the Korban Pesach. Now, the Korban Pesach, of course, is, a mitzvah, is the one mitzvah we're not able to do today because we don't have a base of mikdash. But one of the halachas of Korban Pesach is a very interesting halacha, and that is you're not allowed to bring the Korban Pesach as an isolated individual. Meaning, even if I have a big appetite and even if I have a little lamb and I could finish the whole thing myself, I must join with other people. I either bring it with my family, or if I don't have my family, I connect to another family, or if a bunch of people don't have a family, they create their own chabura, it's called, that's what it's called, our own group, and we bring the Korban Pesach. And what's the lesson here for spiritual liberation? That in order to be liberated, you can't really make the journey alone. You need to connect to others who share that journey, who share that priority. Now, Pirkei Avos talks about buy for yourself or acquire for yourself a chaver, a friend. And the Rambam says there are three reasons. Actually, he's actually taken from Aristotle, interestingly enough, but, but the Rambam uh, says there are three reasons why friendship is important. Why, why, why do you need a friend? One is, we'll use modern terms, one is utilitarian. That, you know, it's, 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 like having a friend is like a life insurance policy. You know, I, I, what if I lose my keys, my car keys? Or what if I'm stranded? What if I don't have money? Who do I call? If you have no friends, like, who do you call? So in that sense, it's simply utilitarian. I better have a friend because in case something happens, I need somebody to call. That's utilitarian, practical. The second is social. You know, we get lonely, and it's good to have people you can talk to. A man is a, as Aristotle says, man is a social being. Even if you're an introvert, so an introvert doesn't like a crowd, but usually, you know, one person, whatever it is, somebody that they can talk to. But the Rambam says all of that is important, but that's not the most important idea of friendship. The deepest level of friendship is what we might call spiritual fellowship, in which each person helps the other person become a better person than they would be by themselves. Whether it's in the context of marriage, husband and wife, which is why friendship is so important. People sometimes think, oh, in the Sheva Brachas, we describe husband and wife as beloved friends, reyim ahuvim. Some people say, ah, oh, that's all it is. What about romance? What about, you know, friends? That's what they are? That's because we don't appreciate friends. We think friends is, oh, go out for a cup of coffee and schmooze a little bit. A friend in the deepest level is someone that helps me be a better person, who cares enough about me that if I'm faltering in some spiritual way, they will help build me up as I will do for them. Those types of friendships, by the way, are sometimes not easy. They are challenging. They sometimes require honesty and frankness. But when it comes from love and care, you know, you can take it. You can, you can learn from that. So how do we allow the Seder alone? Huh? Say again? How do we allow well, the Seder well, alone? Well, let me put it this way. I mean, so I'll be... against everything you, know, you said in the last five minutes. No, you're 100% correct. Uh, ideally, of course, a Seder should not be alone, 100%. But, but, nevertheless, oh, okay, now you're asking why is it different than the Korban Pesach itself. I mean, that's, a, that's that, you're right. In other words, technically what would happen is this. It's a strange situation. In the time of the Beis HaMikdash, if you had a Seder alone, you wouldn't have the Korban Pesach. That, that's actually right. Uh, but nevertheless, there are enough other elements that you do the best you can. You know, if a person does have to live alone, they still have to make, you know, they have a responsibility to make their life as good as they can make it but it's certainly not an optimal condition. So, the Kitsur, what I want to say is, I'm, what I did tonight was, I drew maybe an uneasy bridge 
between Rav Chaim of Brisk and the world of Hasidus. I hope in the world of truth, Rav Chaim and the Hasidim get along. And that is, Rav Chaim enumerated four structural elements that differentiate Sipur from Zechira. One is She'ila u'tshuva, Matzchil b'ginutz m'sayim b'shvach, Pesach Matzimara, which you count to this one, but there are really three. And the fourth one is, each person must regard themselves as if they were taken out of Mitzrayim. We then drew on the Balatanya that the fourth element means each person must identify their own Mitzrayims and understand that the koach of Yitziat Mitzrayim is to liberate them from their, ens their enslavements. In light of that insight, we now understand the other three ideas, that that's part of the process. Be open to explore, question and answer, Understand that even in the setbacks and adversities of life, there is great redemptive potential. Moror, be honest in acknowledging your slavery. Matzah, but take action, not to be mired down in victimization. And Pesach, find other people in your world that will go on that journey with you. And in that way, we can achieve a liberation from that which enslaves us. So I, I wish everybody to have a Chag Kasher V'Sameach, a truly liberating Pesach. And uh, may the month of Nisan be the month of Geula, both in terms of our individual uh, predicaments and for all of Kuala Yisrael and for all of the world. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.